setting up the stream. It's just about to start. Okay, I think we'll just get started, Christine. Sounds good. Hi everyone, welcome to Lanarkshire Family History Society's mm -hmm. webinar for May. My name is Claire Wilson and I will be your host this evening. My co-host tonight is Christine Woodcock. How are you doing, Christine? Good, good, good. Good. How's the weather in Canada? Finally getting spring. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, up to this point, we've all still had our furnace on. <laughs> We're certainly not getting that in Scotland, I can tell you. <laughs> um, I'm just going to quickly run through some housekeeping before I introduce tonight's guest speaker. We are streaming live to YouTube, so if you'd rather not be seen, then please turn off your camera. We would be obliged if you would mute yourself unless speaking, as this ensures that everyone who can hear the presentation uh, with the least amount of background noise. And as Zoom is becoming even more popular these days, if you can turn your cameras off during the presentation, hopefully it will improve the bandwidth and stop any delays or freezing screens as well. So with us this evening is Paul Nixon, who will be providing a talk on British Army ancestors in old photographs. This presentation will look at where to find photographs, how to read clues in those photographs, and how to improve your chances of success in finding them. Um, Paul has been researching British Army soldiers for over 40 years. His interest was triggered by his grandfather, who served with the Royal Garrison Artillery in World War I. For the last 10 years, Paul has been lucky enough to work for Find My Past, and so the lines between business and pleasure have been blurred, to say the least. Although now firmly rooted in Essex, the county of his birth, Paul has travelled widely and lived in India for seven years, uh, arrived in the country with his laptop and suitcase, and would later return to the UK with a wife and three children. There you go. I know. <laughs> <laughs> That How's that some, for power shopping? That was, <laughs> that was some trip, yep. <laughs> so Paul, has a, he's written ex, um, extensively on military genealogy and is the owner of the British Army Ancestors website. Um, I will put a link to the website in the chat for everyone. How are you this evening, Paul? I'm very good, thanks very much. Yeah, I'll tell you, that was the most expensive trip to India ever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still, I'm still paying for still it paying. as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, funny. Um, I actually kind of thought, am I going to be able to say this without laughing? <laughs> yeah, expensive. Um, yeah, my daughter, my daughter is 15 now, and she's uh, she'll be 16 in in um, a couple of months' time. So, yeah, time flies, doesn't it? Oh. Yeah, I know. That's that. You wonder where the time goes. Um, so if anyone has any questions for Paul, you can ask them in the chat box, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, if your question's a bit more complex and you wish to speak to him directly, then just pop a note in the chat box that you have a question and we will come to, to these at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Paul. You can, should be able to yes. share their screen. If everyone can turn off their cameras, just to make sure that we don't have any freezing screens or... There you go. Hopefully you can see that. Um, thumbs up, Claire. Can you see that? All right. Yeah, I can see that. Fine, Paul. Thank you. That's good. Good. OK. So, well, uh, it gives me great pleasure to talk to you. And I'm sure that I've met some of you before. Um, I, I came up with Find My Past a few years ago to uh, New Lanark, um, to the mill. And I, there was a family history, Scottish Association of Family History Societies meeting there at that particular time. And I, I, and I was, um, I think I stayed in Motherwell and... 
uh, maybe that was another occasion. But anyway, I, I love Scotland and, and, I, and I'm sure I've met some of you. Um, and, and it gives me great pleasure to talk about something that is very close to my heart, and that's um, British Army soldiers in old photographs. Um, what you can see there on this slide is just a selection of photos that I have. Um, I picked these up on eBay uh, a few years ago now. Um, most, the vast majority, I think all of those are unnamed and that's the frustration really. It's as, as interesting as that as the army is and as those men's lives were, it becomes so much more interesting if you know a little bit more about them and who they were. So let me go on to the next slide. So uh, I won't spend too, too long on this, but yes, British born, married with three children. Uh, my grandfather's First World War um, and my three times great grandfather was in the Crimean War, a, a colour sergeant. I've been interested in military history for the last 40 years, uh, triggered by my grandfather's death. Um, and like so many of us, are regretting that we hadn't asked our grandparents or parents more questions when they were alive. And, and I sort of compensated for that by then, um, going out and interviewing First World War veterans in Chelmsford where I lived, where I still live. Um, I, I was 18, so we were going out uh, meeting girls. I was getting on, on my bicycle and taking a picture and going around old people's homes saying, have you got any First World War men here? So that, so, so that, was, that was what I did. Um, and, I, and I interviewed a lot of men. But as I say, um, or as, as Claire mentioned, I've been employed by Find My Past uh, since I returned from India in 2010. And uh, I write a number of blogs. Uh, I also have the British uh, Army Ancestors.co.uk website, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute as well. So, uh, as Claire mentioned, this talk will be about where to find photographs. Um, I don't mean necessarily, you know, antique shops and um, down the back of old, old sofas and in, in attics. I mean where where to find pub published sources of, of photos, both online and and uh, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, what to look for in photographs, uh, how to read photographs, and also how to improve your chances of success at finding a photograph of your military ancestor. So that's the site that I mentioned, British Army Ancestors, which is my site, which I set up um, in 2017. It's, it's not a Lives of the First World War, although it does have many of the photos that you'll find on Lives of the First World War, but the scope is far larger than that. It's, it goes, it, it's photographs of soldiers per se. And so it covers the period principally at the moment from 1850, birth of photography, the Victorian soldier, and, and through to, to 1950 or 1945. And it's a database, it's a searchable database. So the data on the site comes from the National Archives, it comes from Find My Past, um, and there's 12 million records that you can search very easily um, and over 100,000 photos. So uh, these are just a couple of screenshots I took from the gallery page on the site today. Um, I've, I've added a couple of these, um, but most have been added by, by people who register, register the site, register with the site um, and come on search for, search for their ancestor and add a photo. It is a very, very simple process. Uh, so here's what, what you would typically see. So in this particular instance, I searched for Charles Sabaran, who's a man I researched some years ago. He uh, lost his leg on the first day of the of, uh, Battle of Mons, 23rd of August, 1914. And that's a picture of him uh, recuperating at uh, a place called Chaley. And in this particular case, I, I, I searched for his name um, and came up with two results. So one of those records there is his record in WO363 and the other one is in uh, his metal index card. So if you were to click on those buttons, that would take you, uh, in the first case, it would take you to find my pass where you could download his record if you had a sub or if you had PPV. And the other one, it takes you straight through to the National Archives. So so basically the site works in several ways. It's, it's a way to um, add photos, but it's also a way to see what's available for soldiers. As, as I say, it covers uh, service records, um, Scots Guards records, Civil War badge, um, various record sources. There's, there's lots of data there and, there and I will be adding more data this year. So I'm hoping to get up to 20 million records um, by, by the end of the year. Of course, the big data source that we all want, which we, which we don't have at the moment, is the Second World War records because the, um, those records are still with the MOD. Although the MOD has an index of, of names, it hasn't been released. Um, so at the moment, Second World War records, as we know, are incomplete. But as regards photos, um, 
of course, millions of photographs of soldiers have been taken over the years. And that's that selection I showed you at the start of my photos is, is very typical. I mean, soldiers would go into studios, uh, have photos taken, photos that that they would send home to loved ones. I think particularly in the first war as well, when so many men became soldiers and would never have intended on becoming a soldier, it would have been a novelty to take a photo of themselves in uniform. And there were so many studios around, their friends were doing it. And so, you, of course, you have millions of photos. Um, and they don't all have information on the back. Why, why would you, why would we now for that matter, take a photo of ourselves and write our names on the back of it? We, we, we post, post it on Facebook or, or send it as an email attachment to somebody, but you wouldn't necessarily write on it, oh, this is me, Paul Nixon, and this is the date and this is the location. Why, why would you do that? And that's pretty much the same uh, for many of the photos that you find now in, in antique shops or elsewhere, it often doesn't have a name on it. So, so the vast majority that we have are unnamed. Um, photos were reproduced as cabinet cards, as carte de visite, postcards, prints. Um, and you do find also, if you're lucky, some images published in newspapers and regimental chronicles and books and, and the like, but, uh, and also newspapers, which we'll also come to. But despite there being millions of photos, um, there, there's still, of course, many, many men who, who, who wouldn't have been photographed. And, and as I say, many photos that, that are unnamed. Um, I'll take you through various examples in, in this presentation, um, but you definitely stand more chance of finding a photo if, if your military ancestor fell into certain categories. And, I, and I've tried to try to work out these categories in, in order. Now, of, of course, the first one, if your ancestor was a recipient of the Victoria Cross, it, it's almost certain that there will be a photo of him somewhere. Um, that that uh, category of ancestor doesn't uh, apply to many of us. Um, dead officers who attended public schools, um, I'm, I'm talking principally about Victorian era and First World War. Um, many public schools published books after the war um, in memoriam roles, in memoriam volumes to commemorate the dead. And so you will find officers in, in those books. And as I say, many, many, I would say the majority of the public schools published books like this. Um, officers would also appear in obituaries in newspapers as well, particularly in the early stages of the, of the First World War. Um, a dead officer per se, um, for the same reason, um, so, so wouldn't appear in a public school book because didn't go to public school, but more than likely would appear in a newspaper. Um, other rank gallantry medal recipients, photos might be taken of, of those men, um, and particularly as say if they died uh, during the conflict. And you know, depending where you lived, um, some, some newspapers published photos, um, others didn't. So I was researching some men recently, um, or I happened to see them on, on the memorial in Chelmsford. Uh, now Chelmsford's a, uh, slightly unusual because it has a memorial, but I suppose because it was a big town, it doesn't have, it's like Colchester, I suppose, it doesn't have uh, enough space on the memorial to record the names or the memorial was so constructed not to be able to record names. So, so those names appear in a, another civic building, but, but Chelmsford does have a memorial to the Boer War uh, for the Essex Regiment, and there were a couple of men on that memorial, um, or three men called Kettle, uh, as in calling the kettle black. Um, and, and two of those men were mentioned in the Essex Chronicle, and there are photos of those men in that in that newspaper. Tremendous amount of information, um, so, so very lucky on, on those two. Um, and then finally, I suppose, um, officers and senior NCOs who were original members of an expeditionary force uh, battalion or new army battalion, who may have appeared in photo groups. Again, lots of those, you find those photos in uh, publications like the Tatler, uh, the Graphic, um, Illustrated London News, those types of publications. Um, on, on Find My Past, if you go to the um, British newspaper archive, you'll, you'll find those publications. And they are a treasure trove, really. You get the obituaries and, and you get some of these group photos as well, where all the people are named. Um, Tools of the trade. I mean, when you're trying to identify photos, this is just a small selection of, of books from my library. Um, but, you know, there are, there are various books out there for identifying collar badges, identifying uh, uniforms, identifying cap badges. Um, there are some very helpful groups as well. On Facebook, uh, there's a group called Soldiers of the Queen. Um, and there's also the Victorian Military Society, which I, uh, I belong to both those groups. I don't tend to, to visit them uh, too much these days because just the pressure of other things really but uh, but they are very helpful and there's some very knowledgeable people on there uh, far not far more knowledgeable than I am although I'm going to be talking to you about 
photos. I, I don't necessarily consider myself a, um, a, an army uniform expert. I, th there are some things I, I can spot and I will know, but but uniforms, uh, so, was, there are so many different patterns of uniform and patterns could run into a year when the next pattern had been issued. And so, so it might be slightly out of sync, but there, is, there are so many variations on, in uniform and there are some uh, some very well-informed and well-educated people um, on both on the Soldiers of the Queen uh, website, um, which is run by a chap called Edward Garcia, who's uh, based in America, extremely knowledgeable man, um, and the Victorian Military Society as well. And then you have these uh, these forums, again, full of um, experts, actually, the Great War Forum for the First World War and WW2 Talk for the Second World War. Um, Back in the day, a, a magnifying glass or a, what's called a linen uh, counter was uh, would be very useful because you can zoom in on the images and, and I still have mine there. But now, of course, you have the ability to scan photos and and, and I would always say scan at a high resolution, um, 300 to 600 uh, dots per inch, uh, if, if you can, or, or higher even, because you'd really need that. Um, that high resolution to scan in, particularly when you're looking at these photos, it might be a carte de visite photo, quite a small photo, and you're trying to read a, a collar title there. Um, I mean, you can see in this extract here that this man is wearing the collar badges of the Gloucestershire Regiment, there's the Sphinx and, um, and the word Egypt, and on his shoulder title, you can just make out the, the GLO of the Gloucestershire Regiment. So, so that's why you need to scan it at a high resolution. So here we have um, on, on the left hand side cabinet cards and on the right hand side carte de visite. So, so the carte de visite um, is, uh, came, came before the cabinet card. It's smaller, actually. This illustration serves my purposes quite well because it's the same man, uh, both serving with the Loyal North Lancashire Regiment, um, both taken in Preston. So Preston, Lancashire, that, that fits. Um, and you've got the dimensions there for the, for the cabinet card and, and, the, and the CDV, both widely used. Um, both commonly found in antique shops. I, I say antique shops. I mean, who's been to an antique shop in the last 12 months? You find them on eBay as well, you know. So here's, a, here's another cabinet card. Um, and I'll just point out some of the things to look for on a typical photo like this. Um, so you'd be looking at the jacket pattern. You'd be looking at the trouser pattern, looking for stripes, um, thin stripes for infantry, wider stripes for artillery and Royal Engineers. Uh, you'll be looking for badges and any insignia, in, insignia. Collar badges you're looking for, you're looking for cap badges and cap styles, uh, accoutrements, so the belt in this case, um, that's his, uh, his white belt. Looking for the photographer and the location, looking for the colour of the facings, so you have the, the uniform and the facings, the facings are collars and cuffs. And also don't forget to check the back of the photograph because you might often find something on the back of the photograph as well. So in this case, um, this uniform dates to 1881 to 1902. You have the thin stripe on there because it's infantry. You can't see that on this on this particular photo. Um, uh, but, but, it, but because he's infantry, it would be a thin red stripe. Uh, he has a single good conduct chevron on his arm, which means uh, that he's served in the army for two years or he's been well behaved uh, for, for two years he could have served longer than that but he's been in the army for at least two years uh, he's, he serves with the Leinster regiment that's the collar badge there that he's wearing and that's also supported by the cap badge uh, the Slade Wallace belt is is the belt that he's wearing you've got the photographer and location down there it's uh, WH Jacob based in Sandgate and Hythe and in Hythe uh, you've got blue facings uh, there on on his um, jacket but Hythe um, was the place where men went to uh, take courses of musketry so perhaps he was in Hythe um, doing a course of mus musketry and the other thing to look at for for the regiments and the locations when you know that um, is to check where the regiments were at a particular point in time and, and there are there are ways of doing that by checking records on on Find My Past and Ancestry for that matter Incidentally, I should say that although I work for Find My Past, I'm not going to sell you Find My Past throughout this talk. If I think something's better on Ancestry, I'll tell you. Um, but but in this case, I do find that searching for military records on, on Find My Past is easier than it is on Ancestry. So uh, we have here th uh, three uh, 
three different photos and three different regiments. Um, on, on the left hand side, we've got men from the King's Royal Rifle Corps. Um, so, so they and the Rifle Brigade wore very distinctive uniforms. So the, the, the KRRC wore uh, green uniform with scarlet facings and, and the Rifle Brigade wore green uniform with black facing. So that's how you tell those apart. Of course, it doesn't make, matter a jot when you're looking at black and white photos, does it? But 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 that was how that was the distinction. And, and both those two regiments were um, based at Winchester as well in Hampshire. Uh, the second one, the middleman, uh, he's Lincolnshire Regiment, uh, scarlet um, uniform and white facing, so the white collars and cuffs. And then the man on the end is uh, Royal Sussex Regiment, so he's wearing scarlet with um, with blue facing. So again, you wouldn't necessarily notice if you look now that of course you you know that he's wearing blue cuffs you can say oh yes that's a different sh shade of gray on his right arm there but you can't necessarily see on his left arm that that's there's any difference in color but generally uh, the royal regiments wore the blue facings so royal sussex regiment the royal of the, of the title means that they wear the blue facings and, and the man on the uh, on the right is royal sussex English and Welsh line infantry have mostly white fa facings. Uh, Scottish regiments have yellow. Irish regiments have green facings, except those which are, are, are the Royal regiments and the Leinster regiment was Royal. So that the chap that we looked at a minute ago, uh, he would be having blue on his uh, jacket, on his cuffs and his collars. And as I mentioned, the Rifle Brigade wore green and black and the King's Royal Rifle Corps wore green and scarlet. <clears throat> So um, I'm just going to take that a, a little bit further and show you, uh, talk you through this photograph, um, which I find quite interesting. I've, I, I bought this uh, on eBay some while ago. Um, it's, there's a little bit of damage there to the right, which you can just about see. But it says on the bottom of the photo, Shropshire Regiment on board SS Malta. But when you look at the photo, you find there's, there's a lot more than just the Shropshire Regiment. So you, you have on there, the Rifle Brigade, you've got the King's Shropshire Light Infantry, um, you've got the Northumberland Fusiliers and you've got the East Lancashire Regiment. Th those are certainly cap badges that I've identified from this photo. So there's, uh, I'm just going to put some arrows in and, and, and show you, but we'll go into, into this photo in a little more detail. Shropshire Light Infantry there, um, Rifle Brigade there, East Lancs and Northumberland Fusiliers. And again, if these men, if this was a colour photograph, if this was colourised, you'd see immediately the difference in some of these uniforms. You can see at a glance anyway, looking at this, the white cuffs on some men and others, the blue cuffs or, or, or non-white, shall we say. So there is a difference and we'll go into that now. So here, this is, this is from the centre group, centre of that last group. You've got this man's wearing a, a rifle brigade shoulder title. Uh, this man has a has NF on his shoulder title, so that's Northumberland Fusiliers. And he's also wearing the Good Conduct Chevron that we looked at a, a minute ago. And he's got the jam pot cuff, which tells you it's before 1902. Uh, and this chap also is carrying a copy of Pearson's Weekly. You can see there, uh, again, having scanned the photo to quite a high resolution, that it says Pearson's Weekly. That was first published in 1890 by... Arthur Pearson, who was later Sir Arthur Pearson, who, who went blind in later life and went on to found St Dunstan's, which was the hospital for blinded soldiers in the First World War. So knowing that was Pearson's week, weekly, I then thought, well, OK, let's see if I can um, identify the, the issue that it was, because uh, you know, find my past. Uh, we have access to the British newspaper archive as well. And Pearson's Weekly is one of the publications that we publish on the, the BNA. And sure enough, I found it. It's the week ending April 30th, 1898. And I tried to do a crop there. I wasn't sure when I looked at the original what that illustration was. It looked to me like it could be a mountain range, but it turns out to be a woman's head. Um, so that's, but anyway, I was very pleased to have identified the, the issue because that could date the photo, couldn't it? It's either either the man, man is holding um, a current copy of Pearson's Weekly or uh, or he's traveling later and he's carrying a very old copy but it's certainly the photo can't date to before that date um so so that that's a nice pointer so here's an, some more men from that same photo um again east lancashire regiment you've got the um the collar badge this man's a drummer as well you've got his proficiency badge there this man who's standing has got at least six years service because he's wearing two good good conduct chevrons so you've got the first one 
from uh, for two years and then the next one for six years, although that changed, that qualification changed in 1906 from six years to five years. So you only had to be well behaved for five years to get the second badge from 1906. Uh, this, the man below there is a Lance Corporal. Uh, and you can just see that chap in there, not invited to the party. He's, he's managed to fit himself into the photo, but, but maybe he's a, a sailor. You can't really tell very much from, from that photo. And that's how it could look if it was in colour. Um, it's not the best colourisation, um, but it does give you an idea of the different uniforms there. Uh, the, the, the blue isn't quite right, um, and, and probably neither is the scarlet, but at least you can see the difference. You can see the man on the left is wearing the white, the man on the right is wearing the blue, and then you've got the rifle brigade man in the middle. So they would have been a colourful bunch. Um, if that photo was all colourised, it would look great. So um, just looking in a little bit more detail now, looking at collar badges. Um, so again, going back to our Loyal North Lancashire photo uh, that we looked at earlier, that's the one on the left. Look at the collar badges there. And you can see the, uh, for verification, I found a, a Galen Polden photograph on the right um, and also a collar badge reference, probably uh, from the internet online, um, which is there at the top. This man is wearing cross swords above his uh, sergeant stripe, so he's a sergeant instructor in gymnastics. Uh, this man's wearing a marksman. Again, he's got uh, two, two uh, good conduct chevrons on his lower left sleeve. The man on the left has the jam pot cuffs, but the man on the right has the pointed cuffs, th those two soldiers, so that you can see the difference there in the uniforms. The, 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 the rounded cuffs, the jam pot, so-called jam pot cuffs on, on the left, and the pointed stripes on the right, which is a, a bit later, 1902 to 1913. And, and again, uh, you can't see the, the thin red stripe on the, on, on the photograph, but you can definitely see it on the illustration. And also look for campaign medals to date a photo. So on the, on the right hand side, on the illustration, you can see that man is wearing the, the Boer War campaign medals for the Queen South Africa and the King South Africa medal. So that means that photo or that illustration must date to after the Boer War. This uh, is a tale of two sergeants, this one. It's the Royal Sussex Regiment. On the, on the left hand side, you have the red jacket. Um, or well, the scarlet jacket, red sash, blue facings, and jam pot cuffs. So that photo dates to between 1881 and 1902. And on this one, um, you've got the red jacket, red sash, blue facings. Uh, you can't see the cuffs, but the white piping around the shoulder strap states it to between 1902 and 1913. And the first Royal Sussex was stationed in Rawalpindi uh, on the northwest frontier between 1911 and 1913. So that photo possibly dates to that sort of time. So here's another one. Um, th this is from um, the Scottish Rifles book, the second battalion of Scottish Rifles. Um, I, I had this book at one stage and then and then sold it, but I, uh, not before digitizing all the images um, to a high resolution, I should say. But but it's a great book um, because it publishes these photos of uh, the, of the officers in 1913. Uh, a couple of years later, a lot of these men would be dead, um, having been killed at Neuve Chapelle in early 1915. But in this particular photo, they're all named, and it was one of a series of books, uh, battalion books uh, that that was published around this time that it wasn't they weren't undertaken for all regiments I do have some photos for some other regiments but they're they're quite scarce now um, and as well as this named officer photo group there were other photos of the uh, the different companies of the Scottish Rifles sec second Scottish Rifles so I mean if anyone listening has um, uh, ancestors who served with the second Scottish Rifles um, pre-first world war and it is just the year before, 1913, when the battalion was in Malta, um, and you want a copy of a, a particular um, company or the officers, then let me know, um, and I'll and I'll send it to you. Um, as I say, unfortunately, the, the photos are not named for the, for the other ranks, but there are separate photos of um, uh, signalers, uh, machine gun section, uh, NCOs. They're they're very useful references, but you just think, gosh, I just wish I knew those. The names of those people and, and where they're positioned in the photos. So here's an example of um, C Company from, from this same book. Uh, you can see what I mean. So you, 
you could work out who the officers were at the front by because you've got the names from the previous photo, but who the men are, it's just impossible to, to say. Um, the person who bought the book from me uh, had an ancestor in one of these photos, uh, and I think he probably knew uh, who the ancestor was, or certainly knew who he was, um, but, but uh, knew what he looked like, and so he was able to then add this uh, book to his collection. Um, Christine will know this um, photo because I've recently um, written an, an article about it. And and I, and again, I purchased this some while ago. Um, and it's an interesting photo because when I bought it, I didn't know anything about it really. It was, there's a photographer there at the bottom um, to say that it's from Dorchester. Um, but, the, but there's very little else about the photo. There were some, there's some notes scribbled on it. Um, but of course, you don't know where these photos, when the notes were written, uh, were they written at the time or were they written many years later? And it turns out that these notes were written many years later because the man in the middle um, is recorded as Major Pope. And, and in fact, he wasn't a major until 1906. And this photo definitely dates to before then. So, so these are the men, um, all carrying rifles or most of them carrying rifles. There's the ones that are very visible there that you can see. And there's also, um, four rifles, I think. There's a couple that are partially obscured, um, being held by men in the back row. So this is obviously, um, you know, a, a rifle team or a shooting team. Um, and thanks to the information on there, you've got the information about this man, Major Major Rolf Pope. Um, and then you just do the research, don't you? You've, you've that's a fairly uncommon name, but it turns out that he was from the Eldridge Pope Brewing family, a brewer that is still very much um, going strong. And then you can find him on the different census returns, 1939 register. Again, uh, this man is named in the margin as Mr. Gregory, uh, ex Dorset regiments, a gunnery storeman at Company HQ, Princes Street. So there again, there's a nice clue. Company HQ, this is a particular company um, and the HQ is Princes Street. And thankfully there's papers for this man in W97, which you can download from Find My Past. And again, another man here, a great photo, Sergeant Harris, or uh, Samuel Harris, uh, says head gardener, borough gardens. Now the head, the, the borough gardens didn't open until uh, 1896. Um, he appears on the 1891 census as a nurseryman and in 1901 census, he was a corporation gardener. And in this particular photo, again, looking at the photo and understanding the photo on his right sleeve, you've got efficiency stars there. And, and there was a particular way in the, which those stars had to be sewn on a particular pattern. And he's got six stars there. Each one of those stars represented five years efficient service. So that means he's been in uniform for, for 30 years. Um, and, and his rank is a color sergeant in that photo. Um, and you've got the crossed rifles there above his, uh, on his left sleeve. And there's the stripes. Another man, Bellinger, um, from the same photo, he was a butcher. Uh, he, in this photo, he's wearing the crown above the cross rifles. So you can see that he, at the time this photo was taken, he was the best shot in the company. But unfortunately, you can't see the rank um, because his, his sleeve is obscured just, just where the, those, uh, the rank insignia would appear. Um, Rolf Pope's head is blocking, blocking the view. But, but Bellinger was certainly in the company shooting team uh, between 1890 and 1895. And this was the, uh, the the first volunteer battalion Dorsetshire regiment uh, shooting team. This is this is who we're looking at. And then, as as I mentioned, the the photographer, the stamp on the bottom uh, says Dorchester and H R Smith uh, with a Y, the photographer. And this is H R Smith who's standing up. Um, it, he's noted on the photograph as being Smith photographer. And again, do the research, look on Find My Past or Ancestry for that metal fold three, I think you'd find these, these ones. Um, uh, you've got the service record. He, he did subsequently go out and fight in the Boer War for a year. Um, he's, he's not in uniform in the photo, but he was very much a, a serving member of the first volunteer battalion, not an officer. Uh, he, he was another rank. Um, and I think he was a sergeant by the time he went to South Africa. But um, yeah, there's a lot of things you can pick out from that photo. There are 16 men in the photo, 10 of them wear uniform, uh, five wear marksman's badges. Um, the color sergeant far left wears cloth shoulder titles, which state 1DV, confirming that he's that's 1st Dorsetshire Volunteer Battalion. 
and then you know, looking through newspapers, you find uh, a lot of these men mentioned. Oh, sorry, let me just go back. Um, so if you were to look at that little, that, that little extract at the bottom there, you've got Color Sergeant Harris at the top. Uh, you've got Lieutenant Pope. Uh, so that's, that's who's indicated as Major Rolf Pope. Uh, you've got Bellinger on there as well. Um, and then you've got other men. So some of these other men, Nobbs Guy, Miles, Robinson, Higgins, they could well, and Sergeant Windsor, they could well be some of those other faces in that photo. Don't, you don't know. But, um, but suffice to say that there's a lot of information on the photo and pulling those clues together can help you date it. So that, so that photo at the bottom left dates to 1894. Uh, and I think the photo probably dates to between 1896 and 1900. Um, as I say, Rolf Pope was only a lieutenant in the extract. Um, and, and the Borough Gardens where Sergeant Harris was head gardener didn't open until 1896. But as I say, that, that information was written a, a good deal later. But I think looking at the uniform, looking at the newspaper reports, it's probably around um, 1896 to 1900. Uh, and as we're on the subject of volunteers, here's another um, shot of a, of a volunteer. Uh, so wearing that, that Austrian knot is very distinctive, that, that pattern on the cuff is very distinctive for the volunteers. And you have the diamond there above the Austrian knot, which was awarded um, to men uh, returned efficient in uh, rifle drill and practice. And after five years efficiency, they got the star. So that's why he's got the star. So again, this man has been a volunteer for at least five years. Again, frustrating. We don't know which regiment, uh, what, what his name is. We don't know the regiment necessarily. I've not researched that regiment actually. Probably could do because the, the, the badge on his... Uh, headgear is, is fairly distinctive. Um, he's certainly a sergeant, you can see that from the stripes. And even the smallest clues can be vital. Now somebody uh, sent this photo to me and I was doing some research for this person and they, and they said who, uh, I think they, they knew the name of this individual but they, didn't, they weren't sure in what capacity he was uh, serving or they knew he'd had different service, service over, over a number of years. And, and this man, had served with the Scottish Regiment, if memory serves me correctly, but by the time this photo was taken, uh, he certainly wasn't with the regulars, he was with the volunteers, because you can make that out from that pointed star, which is just visible. I, I've not cropped the photo, that's how it came, but you can just see from that photo, there is a star above the sergeant's stripes. And what that is, it's a four-pointed proficiency star, it was to be worn above to be worn above all others uh, was the instruction by senior NCOs in the volunteer force and, and later the territorial force. It was never worn by soldiers in the regular army. So, so that tells you that this must have been, this man must have been with the volunteer force uh, or the TF. In actual fact, it was the VF. And here's another photo showing you um, a man from the VF with a clearer depiction of the four pointed star above his stripes. So this is, um, these are two photos from uh, Majurai. I was in Majurai uh, about this time last year, actually. Um, but this soldier's from the Lincolnshire Regiment and uh, Frank Richards, who's well worth reading. If Even if none of you have uh, sol soldier ancestors who served in India, Frank Richards is always a delight um, to read his accounts of soldiering in India. And, and he later soldiered with the um, Royal Welsh Fusiliers during the First World War as well and, and wrote, um, uh, old soldiers never die. But he wrote, on the plains in the winter we wore the thin fine Indian khaki by day during the heat of summer on the plains we wore white on parades and, and here you have the same men, same man, uh, same officer, uh, sorry, uh, sergeant in Majurai wearing the khaki on the left and, and the white on the right. It may even be the same studio with different props but, um, but there's a good example of the Indian dress. If you excuse me I'll just take a swig of water. <clears throat> and here we have another man in whites and again helpfully and deliberately you can see that he's left his um, helmet on on the prop to his to his right and so you can see that that's the king's liverpool regiment because it, again it's very clear and if you zoom in with the with the um uh, with you with your camera you can pick that out pick out the the title on his helmet, pick out the shoulder, the uh, collar badges as well. So you're looking for clues on helmets, you're looking at collars and epaulets, 
Um, and the kings were in India, Burma and Aden between 1877 and, and 1894. So he's he's um, probably taken towards the end of that period. But um, yeah, again, unnamed, but a great photo, a great study. Um, here we have some samples of um, names in newspapers. I mentioned this earlier on for the First World War. You have um, publications like the Graphic, like the Illustrated London News, and you will find that certainly in those early days when the men were first um, being killed, the officers were being killed, that you will probably find write-ups and photos in all of those publications, um, the Tatler as well. Um, so they're very good uh, for, for officers. You've got basically you've got the name there under the photo and on, on the Illustrated London News, you have some very small potted biography at the bottom of the page. Um, Manchester Evening News was also one of those newspapers during the First World War that, that published photos and published small biographies. And I, and I have spent some successful times uh, going through the Manchester Evening News, trying to, trying to pick out photos of deceased servicemen and matching those photos to the photos in the Manchester City Battalion's Book of Honour. Because again, those photos are great photos and the men are all named, but it doesn't tell you where in the photo they are. So, so this example is just of this particular man, Henry Sherratt, uh, service number 9902, who's uh, buried or commemorated, um, uh, he's not, well, he must be commemorated on, on the Tietval Memorial in France. And there's that article in the Manchester Evening News. So again, it's, it, it can be luck of the draw. If, you're, if your ancestor was from Manchester or in the area covered by that Manchester paper, then potentially there could be a photo there, but... Um, of course, a lot of men were killed. Uh, not everyone would, would have a photo, um, but it certainly is worth checking the newspaper archive uh, and more and more papers are being added to that archive every day. And I always say this, you know, today's a fantastic day for researching family history, but tomorrow will be even better because there'll be more papers on the BNA. There'll be more records published by Far My Past, more by Ancestry, you know, you name it. It just gets better and better. And so do, so do use the search on the BNA again, as with everything with, with family history, the uncommon names are the easier ones to, to research. And uh, this, this man, Sherratt, uh, has a fairly uncommon name, um, but, but again, there's enough information on there and the OCR has picked out enough of it. Um, his name is mentioned under the photo, it's mentioned in the text next to him as well. So there's enough information there to have actually found a match when you type in the search term on the BNA, British Newspaper Archive. So uh, here's another photo. Um, this was actually sent to me by somebody in uh, Canada, I think, um, a few years ago now. It shows the 5th uh, Ox and Bucks Light Infantry. It dates to 1914 rather than Volunteer Force, but the 5th Ox and Bucks was a, a Territorial Force Battalion. Fantastic photo, again, all unnamed, but some good detail on the photos. So again, you've got the stars that we talked about earlier on, the, the efficiency stars. And same with the, the TF uh, as, the, as the VF, five years service for each of those. So the man on the, on the far right there, he's got four, so he's served for 20 years. Metal shoulder titles worn by the men, so that indicates territorial force rather than the volunteer force. And that's the, the cap badge, very distinctive uh, cap badge. Light infantry, you always have those hunting horns. Again, a same detail from the same photo. This man's wearing a ribbon from for the Queen South Africa medal for the Boer War. Um, Colour Sergeant Instructor, he is. You can tell that by his insignia, the, the three bar chevrons and cross rifles and the crown. This man uh, has got the shoulder, shoulder title clearly visible and the uh, Colour Sergeant indication as well. And the man in the middle looks to be a very young second Lieutenant, but he's the senior man. The senior man in terms of rank in the photo, but far outranked in terms of experience by the men either side of him. Uh, on this one again, same photo, cross flags indicating signalling qualification. And then we skip seamlessly from Oxfordshire into um, some overseas station for, for the British Regiment, for the, for the um, uh, Queen's Royal West Surrey Regiment. And here you have uh, 
of two football teams, obviously, you, you have um, the, a, a naval team on the left and you have the Queen's Regiment on the right. And helpfully on, on these balls, you have the date, 1902. So I, I bought this photo and several other, others, uh, which you'll see in a minute, saw some of them, um, with the man's medals. And again, I don't know which man actually is the is the owner of the medals that I have. There's lots of photos, um, but it's not indicated on any of them which which is the man. I think possibly it's certainly the Queen's regiment. So if you look at the photo there, not the front row, but the, but the row behind, the man sitting on the right um, next to the uh, linesman holding the flag. I think that's probably the man whose medals I now have and, and whose photos these were. And again, in this photo, he's the man second uh, back row, second left. Um, but I illustrate this photo because you have the information at the bottom written on the photo, which is helpful. Um, number four, section D company, the Queen's Regiment, Doolally. Uh, it's not Diolally, but it's Doolally. And it's it's the same as Doolally, going crazy, going Doolally, because this is where men uh, were, were sent after their term in India was up and they went to Doolally. And, and waited for the ship to take them back. And some of them had to wait a long while. And so while they were waiting, they went to Lally, and that's where the expression comes from. Um, but, but anyway, the photo, the extract um, shows you the drum. Um, so we don't necessarily need to know uh, what's written on the drum because it says it's the Queen's, but, but I use this as an illustration to show you that it's worth zooming in on drums because the drums will contain the name of the regiment as well. Here we have the same men um, from, from the same regiment. And where's my chap? There he is at the back. Um, so on this photo, he's the fifth from the back, um, fifth, fifth left, uh, back row, fifth from the left. Um, and these men are all wearing uh, temperance medals. Frank Richards, um, who I mentioned earlier, old soldier Saab, uh, always thought that temperance or the abstention of alcohol was unnatural behavior. Again, looking at this photo, uh, Queen's collar badges, um, Sergeant Instructor Gymnastics, and he's got all these different medals showing that he's uh, abstained from alcohol for nine years. He certainly looks very mean. I wouldn't want to meet him in, a, in the street. And he's wearing a marksman's badge as well. And the man on the right wearing Queen South Africa medal. And he's a corporal instructor in gymnastics. He's also got a, a chest full of um, uh, army temperance medals. This man is a scout and a marksman. You can see that these um, cloth badges, incidentally, were just loosely affixed to their to their clothing, to their khaki. I mean, it, it was the case in the hot um, climates in the uh, tropical stations that the uniform would need to be washed um, more more regularly and more thoroughly um, and in those days they'd probably be beaten to death on rocks by by dobies um, who were the washers who washed the clothes and so the badges were meant to be lightly affixed so they could be removed easily so the clothes could be washed and then to be dried and then ironed and then the insignia fixed back on. Uh, this man also wears a distance judging badge on his lower right sleeve and this man has uh, the lance his lance corporal and a signals instructor and also a marksman. And a number of the men in this photo wear two good conduct badges. So this, this man has uh, two badges there. So that shows that he's served for six years. And so does the man on, on the left-hand side. The one, the one in the middle has one. And you can see them, the two behind have single uh, good conduct stripes as well. So um, those two uh, sergeant instructors or the sergeant instructor and the corporal instructor, they don't have the chevrons. But that's because their rank, they, they, would, they were senior enough rank, corporal and above, they were expected to be well behaved, so they wouldn't wear the good conduct chevrons. And that's the uh, Army Temperance Medals. Um, I've often thought I should collect these as well, but I collect enough things already, and, uh, and so I haven't done. But I do, I wouldn't rule it out in future. And, and I think they're, they're rather nice. They're, they're, they're base metal, um, but I do think they're nice. Um, and, and also getting more expensive to get hold of these days as well. So here's a couple of examples of uh, the Rifle Brigade uh, from the Rifle Brigade Chronicle. I've, I've owned uh, complete runs of the 
Rifle Brigade Chronicle um, and the King's Royal Rifle Corps Chronicle. And, and in fact, I've digitized those and um, they're available on Find My Past, certainly from 1900. I have to think of the dates now, but I, said, I think Rifle Brigade from 1892 to 1920 and King's Royal Rifle, Rifle Corps from 1900 to 1920. Um, so they're available. So you can search for those on, on Find My Past. And they're very, they're, they're very um, interesting. I mean, if you want to discover that your ancestor came third in the egg and spoon race at um, Lucknow in 1895, then the, the, the regimental chronicles are the place to, to go to look for it. They, they're fascinating. They, they provide fascinating glimpses, but they also often show photos. You'll have team photos, you'll have football, football team photos. In this one, you've got um, this example. You've got a group of men still serving with the 2nd Battalion who landed with it in Gibraltar in November 1874. And you've got a uh, an officer, a dead officer, again, you know, um, going back to our uh, most likely to find a, um, this man's a dead officer um, who was killed in the South African conflict uh, against the Boers. But the uh, the Rifle Brigade Chronicles are, are, are very useful and, um, well, well, all chronicles for that matter. I've also got run of the Ox and Bucks Light Infantry Chronicle from, from when it was first issued in 1892 right through to the... Um, what to 2000 of course the name had changed many times since then but but i have complete runs and very little shelf space left these days postcards um a great source of information for for reference um again looking at the facings on on the left hand side the, the jacket you've got scarlet uh scarlet jacket and you've got the gosling green for the northumberland fusiliers um pointed cuffs again so this is um 1902 onwards and then in the middle you've got um Scots Guards, I think. Let me just go back. I just Scots Guards, and on the right you've got uh, the Sherwood Foresters. But it, they're they're wonderful series. Um, these are from Tux. Um, it's the publisher, Tux Oilette, and you can find these easy enough on eBay. Um, buy them or, or or copy the scans. But but they they make great reference. Um, and I, again, it's a regret that many of these men, well, they're all unnamed and. The man in the middle should be easy enough to identify, and I have identified other similar senior NCOs uh, from from this period. But I've not even tried looking for for the two on the left. Uh, the, the private on the right would be more difficult to identify. Um, and again, some good examples: some Gale and Polden postcards, very commonly found. Um, but this one, just to illustrate the the stripes on on the side. So look look at those um, red stripes on the. Garrison artillery men at the top and the Royal Engineers at the bottom, very thick red stripe on the trousers, whereas the, the Scots Guards um, and the infantry, you can barely see the, the thin stripe on the Cheshire Regiment at the top. Their dress was very, the, 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 the stripe was a thin stripe on those trousers. It's, it's a very easy way to, to tell them apart. So some more photos here. Um, for the artillery, crossed guns with a crown above um, shows the first first prize for this man on the left, and crossed guns with a star above uh, shows a second prize uh, for the man on on the right. Again, both photos from my collection. Both men are wearing walking out dress, um, albeit different patterns of tunic, um, and the badges were awarded from 1898. More artillerymen here. So uh, the Territorial Force, you have uh, the Imperial Service Badge, so that's always a clue. If you find that Imperial Service Badge, you can see it. I'll just click again and an arrow should come shooting in as if by magic. Well, this one's indicating Battery Sergeant Major, um, insignia above the Sergeant Chevrons, and Master Gunner Third Class here. Again, the, the, the insignia is so important. And don't worry, um, I mean, there are there are books, there is there is reference out there, but you will find that if you post a photo on uh, the Soldiers of the Queen website or the Victorian uh, Military Society website on Facebook, um, or just do your homework and look at, there, there used to be a very good website called the Victorian Wars Forum, which folded, um, unfortunately, and there was a lot of information on that site, but, but people on the Great War Forum, for that matter, were you to post this photo, would tell you straight away, oh yes, this is that, and this badge means this, and this means something else. So no no one, knowledge is a wonderful thing, but yeah, it's easy once you know it, but it's the knowing it that takes the time. 
so there's the um, Imperial Service badge there on, on the on the man's uh, lapel. And the Territorial Force men only ever signed up for home service. They didn't sign up to fight overseas. And and so when it did come to the First World War and, and the Territorial Force being mobilised, each of the men serving with the Territorial Force unit had to sign um, an obligation to, well, they didn't have to sign it. They were asked to sign it um, to serve overseas because their contract with the Territorial Force didn't include serving at service overseas. So you will find in service records uh, on Far My Past and elsewhere, uh, this Imperial Service uh, agreement uh, for the man to serve overseas. And and when they agreed, they, they got the badge and that's what the Imperial Service badge is. It's silver. I've got a few of those. Um, and it's just a nice little thing to have, um, um, but commonly seen on photos. And when you see that, you know straight away, okay, this man's with a Territorial Force unit. Again, um, some more distinctive uniform. The Broderick cap uh, suggests that this photo was taken between 1902 and 1905. Uh, blue facings, again, it's Royal Sussex Regiment, 1902 to 1913. And this man's wearing the Queen South Africa medal with three clasps. And I mentioned Hythe earlier on. This is a, a photo from my collection, which shows men at Hythe, actually. It's a lovely photo, again, taken from the same sort of period. So again, you're looking in this photo, you're looking at the regimental insignia, insignia. You're looking for the uniform pattern, the good conduct chevrons, the skillet arm badges, the badges of rank, the medals. These are all photographic clues, which together can help you piece the story together. So there's, there's six regiments here, and there's a color sergeant instructor of musketry sitting in the middle. And they're the regiments. <coughs> Excuse me, you've got the uh, the Black Watch, the Queen's Royal Welsh Fusiliers, South Wales Borderers, Highland Light Infantry and the Royal Scots Fusiliers. And, and the reason I can tell it's those regiments is you can uh, you can tell by looking at the cap badges, by looking at the uh, in terms of the Black Watch, you've got the, the kilt pattern, you've got the, the sporran with the, the tassels on there. It's a very uh, distinctive patterning for the Black Watch. And then looking at the uh, good conduct chevrons here, you've got um, two men who, who are displaying one badge, so that's two years service, and you've got two men who are showing uh, three uh, chevrons, so that's 12 years service for those men. And, and good conduct badges, they were awarded um, between 1860 and 1869, the first badge was awarded for three years, then for eight, then for 13, 18, 23, etc. From 1870, that changed. Um, 1870 to 1905, it was 2, 6, 12. And then from 1906, as mentioned earlier, it was 2, 5, 12, 18, 24, etc. Um, they called it um, undetected crime, actually. I mean, you could be crimed for any number of minor offences. Often you'll look at service records and you'll see awarded good conduct badge, um, deprived good conduct badge, good conduct badge restored, etc. It was often for drunkenness, a man would lose a badge. But you could you could lose badges, earn badges and lose them and still at the end of 21 years or 18 years, get a long service and good conduct medal. I, I suppose it depended on, on the severity of the crime, but, but drunkenness was quite common. And so you do routinely see men um, losing their good conduct badges. And for that matter, you see men starting off their careers in the army in, in a very poor way, but, but very soon knuckling under and, and ending up as first class soldiers. That's very commonly seen on service records. So um, medals, some of these men are wearing medals. So the man um, on the left, the, the black watch man and the man in the middle, they're both wearing Queen South Africa medal. And you can tell that from the shape of the um, medal, the shape of the clasp. Uh, the suspender rather. That's what that medal looked like. And the man on the right is wearing the India General Service Medal. And that looked like that. And the Royal Scots Fusiliers did serve in, in India. He's probably wearing those uh, three clasps. I've got those, I've got that medal and with those three clasps to, to a man uh, with the Royal Scots Fusiliers who went on to become an officer in the First World War. Um, and, um, and so that's what those medals would have looked like. And again, you find the reference. You can look on Dix Noonan Webb website or, or Spink & Co website. Um, both those websites have photographic archive of all the previous lots that they've sold. And not, not, all, not all those auctions have photos actually, but, they, but they, 
but now routinely for every single lot that is goes under the hammer at Dick's Noon and Webb and Spink there are photos um, and they hold lot they hold auctions regularly so you can very quickly find the reference uh, to what the metal would have looked like all sorts of different combinations of metals and clasps so that's a, that's a great resource um, uh, is Dick's Noon and Webb and you'll, you'll also find photos on DNW as well photos of soldiers and, and write-ups and soldiers as well so again another source definitely to explore um, and it's easy to search go to DNW go to Spink type in the name of your soldier um, and, and see what comes up. Sporans. Now, I, I, I'm not going to even attempt to uh, talk to my Scottish audience about Sporans in, in too great a depth, but, but suffice to say that there are uh, Sporans designs changed over time. Um, Highland regiments with kilted regiments, you know this, you could be telling me this. Um, so too did bandsmen in lowland regiments, each regiment wore multiple Sporans. Um, so you'd have a sporran for a commissioned rank, for a pipe major, for a drum major, drummer, etc. Um, and identifying the sporran and tartan will lead you to the regiment. So here's a great photo. Um, this is Black Watch again, um, and I've just put some arrows in there to, to point out the various elements to look for in, in terms of identifying the regiment. Um, and there's there's so many clues on there. Um, from the Sporran to the to the Glengarry and the badge on the Glengarry, the, the Tartan. Um, uh, and this man's uniform identifies him as a pipe major with the, with the Black Watch, with the Royal Highlanders. So um, improving your chances of finding photos. I've on my British Army Ancestors site, I I recently added, I'll say recently, maybe a year ago, added pages for Look, uh, sections for finding a photograph or finding a uh, finding medals um, and I did so because I've had some success with this before uh, only through my blogs really I, I'd written uh, written on my blogs about looking for photos and I know that how the internet search engines work if you if you I mean traditionally you would you would go to people to look for th to, to find things wouldn't you you'd, you'd be well, you put an appeal in a local newspaper, perhaps, you know, some somebody seeks a photo or seeks such and such, you put an advert in a paper. Um, but you would also do your research and approach people. And I've done this myself um, back in the day when I was uh, still mourning my grandfather's loss and, and trying to find a search for veterans. I would be writing to people. I'd be saying, oh, you know, oh, did you serve with this particular regiment? But but these days you can you don't have to do that because the Internet is so... Uh, so helpful. Um, and so the idea is that you publish information online. You put it put it on a, for that matter, if you belong to forums, you have, often have a signature on posts. Put 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 your wants in a signature. The, the search engines will pick it up. Um, in this particular case, on my British Army ancestors site, there is a facility to advertise for a um, that you're looking for a photo um, and put the name in, and then hopefully at some point in time, the search engines will turn up. Or, you know, or somebody will be searching for uh, John William B.B. Gale, who's the third man down there, and say, oh, yes, OK, well, I'm, I can see that um, this person's looking for a photo of John William B.B. Gale, and I have the photo. Let's get in touch. So that's, that's how that works. And I'll give you an example of how it worked for me. So, so this man, um, Captain Alfred Eldred Eilif, MC, his, I need to think of this now, but his, his mother was my great-grandmother's sister. So... Uh, on my on my mother's side so so anyway he's a he's a very distant relative but but being the family uh, magpie I, I tend to get given photos and bits and pieces and so this is um the photo of alf eilif came to me and and i published it on on one of my blogs uh, saying that i sought his medals um i thought well if no, you know if they're in the family great uh, but if somebody not in the family has the medals and they want to sell them, I'd be interested. So, so I posted the photo and, and a request. And uh, there you can see the, see the blog there at the bottom, uh, British Army Medals blog, blog spot. <coughs> Excuse me. And so I posted that and I've never had, had his medals, but somebody did contact me to say, oh, I uh, found your uh, information about Eilif and I think I've just bought a photo of the same man and lo and behold, there it is. So this, this chap had found... Um, this photo on eBay, he bought it and and had been researching it. There was again, this photo was not named. Um, the, the fact was that he was he identified it as Bedfordshire Regiment. He, he saw the, the, the military cross. 
and keying in those terms, Bedfordshire Military Cross somehow brought him to my blog. And he looked at the photo that he bought and looked at the photo that I had and said, hang on, that's the same man. And lo and behold, it was. And so I was uh, tremendously uh, grateful to him because he said, you know, uh, would you like to have the photo? You can have it for what I pay for it. And, and so I bought it from him. So I now have another photo of, uh, of Alf Eilif. And, and in my photo, he doesn't wear the ribbon of the MC, but this one that I bought from this uh, kind chap, he does. Um, and so then having, having that, uh, I think I probably published that. And then lo and behold, somebody else says, well, I've got, I've got some photos of, uh, of some more eyelifts here. And this is the lady on the left. It's in, in that odd headgear is Salvation Army headgear. And it's Queenie Eilif, who is the lady on the left. And, um, and another sister, to, uh, the two women are both eyelifts. Um, and the man behind, uh, between the two girls, behind the two women is um, Queenie's husband. And they all, they all served with the uh, Salvation Army, uh, working in YA uh, MC huts in the First World War in France. And so from having, well, I have got several photos of the Eyelifts anyway, for that matter, but but I suppose it's an uncommon name again. And, you know, people people doing the searching on, just on, on a Google search, came to my site and, and got in touch. So, th so that's the principle. Um, uh, Claire, you sent me this photo. Um, this this uh, tells you we're coming to the end of the presentation because th these are some, uh, what, what follows now are a couple of photos that, that have come to me recently, but Claire, Claire sent me this photo. And uh, on the left, we have Gordon Highlanders, Boer War medals again, QSA and uh, King South Africa. Um, Claire, I didn't, uh, when we spoke last, I hadn't, identified the middleman but he's uh, it's a border horse yeomanry and and the man on the on, next to him is royal artillery so that photo is uh, 1903 onwards probably by our jack of jedburgh um uh, completely bad pronunciation but, but but he was active that photographer was active in that town between 1900 and 1920 so it's so a great photo and you've got infantry yeomanry and artillery You've got three arms of the service. Hmm. Um, this photo was also sent in, um, and and again, I, I can't tell you an awful lot about it. Um, it's called the rest, and you can work out something from it. You can obviously see why it's called the rest. The men are, are resting; they're exhausted. There's a bicycle in the photo um, as well, so it doesn't look as though it's. Um, in war-torn France, does it? They're, they're, they're resting there at ease. They're not under shell fire or anything. It's, um, I, I would suggest it's a, a route march, uh, after a route march. Um, commonly, fo common, commonly photos were taken. I've, I've got a few in my collection of photos taken mid-march mid or when men, men are taking a break. Um, the cat badges, um, it's machine gun corps, but whoever sent the photo in knew that and knew exactly uh, who the person was and and ha also had this identity disc as well. Um, I, I can't read it here. I've not, um, it's not big enough for me to see, but it's, but I can see the number at 132205 machine gun corps. Um, so that's the additional information and you can work out uh, from the number when that number would have been issued. And, and I did do a bit of looking into that. That number wasn't issued until January or February 1918, um, because 132025 was issued on the 24th of January. Uh, uh, 025 is the 24th of January, so 132205 will be a bit later than that. Um, so it's prob probably January, January, February 1918. Where those men are resting, you know, the grass is up, there are leaves on the trees, possibly spring, summer 1918, I would say. So that, that puts a date on it. Um, so Machine Gun Corps probably... Um, Summer in England, um, 1918. That's that's all I can say about that particular photo. And then uh, Jeff, I, I, Jeff King, I I hope you don't mind me calling you out. I, I saw I saw you uh, appearing earlier on when when everybody was joining. Um, uh, you'd asked about this man, Edward Lynch, um, how how you could find out photo for him, try and try and identify a photo, and I guess. There are several several things I'd say, probably all of which you've thought thought about. Um, so, f first of all, family members. I, for my grandfather's brother Jack, who was killed in 1918, um, a chance discussion with one of my father's cousins, who, who was a, a Nixon from another brother, um, revealed that she was in contact with somebody in Canada, um, and, and 
again a relative and this relative sent uh, sent me the identity discs that that jack had worn when he was killed in the first world war they've been taken from his body which is why he has no known grave um he, he must have been found and, and both identity discs were taken the, the idea was that one should be taken the other one stays with the body so that it could be buried and identified but in this case uh, both the discs were taken and i and i have those discs so so family members definitely in, inquire with family members uh, regimental associations uh, in his case um second world war it's it's fast approaching um no living survivors isn't it for, for second world war but but there may be survivors still still regimental associations that are going uh, the world war ii forum so that that is called uh, ww2 talk um, regimental museums newspapers um, and my own um fledgling it's still fledgling i think after four years getting getting more ready for flight than it was um british army ancestors website so so once there are some second world war photos on there it's mostly first world war and earlier but um but the site will still will still keep growing and, and who knows at some point in time a photo may appear on that the chances are of course are that it won't because ju just because of the sheer scale of numbers but but those are all sources uh jeff that i would explore uh if you've not already done so And that's it from me. Um, so thank you again to uh, everybody for listening. I hope uh, what I've told you has um, been interesting. I I welcome comments, feedback, um, uh, uh, post in the chat. Uh, you can always contact me directly if you want to as well. So my uh, BritishArmyAncestors.co.uk and I'm Paul at BritishArmyAncestors.co.uk. And so that's it from me. And I'll happily take some questions now. So I think I did identify, uh, remember I told you about my great grandfather, it's the only picture we have of him. He, uh, his uniform is the same as the Highland Light Infantry that you had in okay. that, where you had the six regiments. Okay, good. That's great. Well, yeah. by all means, uh, send it to me anyway, Christine, and there might be some other stuff on there that I can uh, identify. Super. So I just need to actually work out who these men are in this photograph. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it came, it was in a box that um, was in among my grandfather's, from my grandfather's side. His father's sister married somebody who was from Jedburgh, even though they were mm. from um, Bones. Um, so there's every chance that it's potentially relating to her. Yeah, we'll have a look on, um, go through the tree and then have a look for records on Find My Past. Um, yeah. See if there's any matches there. Yeah. So and I've got, I've got one guy that was missing as well. So, I mean, I'm kind of going, oh, could it be him? Yeah. Well, the one the one on the left in that photo is wearing medals. So there will be a there'll be a medal roll entry for him on Ancestry, if you go to Ancestry and, and go through the medal rolls. See, I told you I wasn't just going to talk about Farmer Past. Ancestry. <laughs> <clears throat> they have the medal rolls. We don't. Um, so, yeah, have a look on Ancestry um, for that name and see if see if he appears there. Okay, I'll do that. I'll do that. I'm just need to go through them all. Um, so Dallas is asking, do you have any photographs of army women? Is that something you get much of? Well, there there are. There's the women's um, uh, army auxiliary corps. Uh, there there are, um, and more in the Second World War as well. There are some. There are also nurses. I've got some nurse photos on my on my side. But um, yeah, of course. I mean, women women had photos taken as well. Um, there, there are fewer photos, um, but they do exist. And you know, if people want to post them on the site, there are records for for women who served in the first and and those who died in the Second World War. That they they are on my site, definitely. Brilliant, brilliant. I've actually I've just remembered that I've got a a massive photograph. Um, my husband's grandfather was in the Royal Engineers, and the photographs actually got every single man in the photograph listed. Oh, good. So okay. I'll, I think it's huge. I might need to try and work out a way to scan it for you. I don't think my scanner's going to be big enough. <laughs> yeah, well, those, those, are, those are terrific. Um, I found a photo, I bought a photo on eBay um, a few years ago now of the, of, I like to say it's, the, it's either the 14th or the 13th Hussars, and it's, it's only a postcard size, but there's about 80 photos on there. Um, and I did scan them all at high resolution, and I managed to identify quite a few, which I've posted on on the site and and 
think I've had three, at least three people have come to me and said, wow, I found my, found my ancestor in that photo. So that's, yeah. that's why I do it. It's, it, I think the men deserve to be, and the women deserve to be remembered, you know, and I, and I just hope the, the, the reason for doing that whole British Army ancestors thing is for, um, you know, you could be, look, we could be looking for the same people on, uh, Christine and I could be looking for the same people on different parts, of the, different sides of the, of the globe. Um, I have the photos. We don't know each other from Adam. I post the photo, Christine searches and she finds it. And that's, that's the aim of it really. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Um, Cause I know that certainly there was a guy in Holland um, that I help out with a bit of research and he was looking for a guy in the Royal Engineers and when I went and looked at this photograph I actually found the photograph of the guy so I was able oh, to, to share it with him so I mean it's quite good for things like that that you've actually got the names and you can yeah. actually find it so yeah yep um, so still got some time for questions if you want to pop them into the chat um, just uh, thought I'd mention as well the webinar for next month takes place on the 10th of June and it's going to be Christine who will provide a talk on researching British home children between 1869 and the Great Depression. Details of how to join have been placed in the chat and will be sent out to members via the usual channels. Um, if you're not a member of Lanarkshire Family History Society, then why not sign up now? Membership fees range between £10 and £16 per year, so it's a bargain. Um, and you can find out more via the website, which is www.lanarkshirefhs.org. Um, and I've also posted details about the member benefits in the chat box. Um, I've also, Claire, just to, sorry to interrupt, but um, sorry, when you go. Paul is going to be doing a two day uh, workshop in November um, on um, military research. And so I posted that in the chat as well for anybody who might be interested in getting more information on that. As you can tell, he's very thorough. I was going to say, like two days, like is that two days solid, Paul? Yeah. <laughs> Might it take is. him a week, but he's only scheduled for two days. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a big undertaking, that one. It's also it's also um, Canadian time as well. What, what, what is it? Men, mount, not mountain time, is it? What, whatever you call your time zone. Eastern so, time. Eastern time. So I've got to adjust myself for that as well. So yeah, I mean, it's, it'll be... I'm looking forward to it. It's, um, so it's, it'll start about two o'clock in the afternoon for UK time. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I'm um, uh, there's four presentations each day, um, and each of them will be similar length to the one I've just given there. Lots of slides, lots of information. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, and Christine's put some details in the chat for that one as well. If there's anyone that even wants to unmute and ask a question, just um, let us know. It's just you're talking, this is totally irrelevant, but you're talking about time zones. In Canada, we have six time zones. Newfoundland gets its own. Well, I'm not surprised. It's a world <laughs> unto itself, Newfoundland. <laughs> it's a huge, huge landmass, isn't it? I'm not surprised uh -huh. when you look at it. It's, it goes on forever. All right, Douglas is asking, you missed the first few minutes. Do you have photos from World War One? My great, my great grandfather and his son served with a K K O S B. Well, yes, I mean there are, as I say, there's there's a hundred thousand photos uh, plus on on the site, but the, but even so, you know, six million men served in the First World War, so the chances are remote. Uh, they're always going to be remote uh, of actually finding a finding your photo. As I say, you stand more chance if some somebody was killed, but. But you have, just have to follow these, uh, be methodical, I think, and, and keep on checking because we could look today and not find something. And then tomorrow something else is up and, and lo and behold, there it is. So so there's that keep checking bit, but there's also the uh, being proactive. It's about putting, you, you can set up, you can create a, create a blog. I, I mean, I have several blogs on Blogger, which I still like. Uh, it's probably a bit dated now, but WordPress or Blogger, just create a free one page blog, uh, write something about your ancestor, uh, write the name large, write the regiment, write the number, photo sort, look at the photos with the contact detail. And then, you know, if the search, the search engines pick it up and somebody a year down the line is, happens to be doing research on that same person, unlikely perhaps, but it does happen. Um, and they see that page, then then you've got a contact. Um, so so definitely do think about going out and uh, and and asking people via a blog or via a, a one page website what you're looking for. 
I'd, yeah, I mean, certainly SEO these days does, I mean, I do a lot with RAF, so I know that, you know, some of the crashes I put on my website, you get family members contacting you saying, oh, I came across it because every now and then I have a quick search for the name in Google. Um, and obviously Google catalogues all these pages in a, in a kind of rotation. So yeah, it, I always swear by a quick internet search. Um, I know that your website is about British Army ancestors, <clears throat> but Murray's asking, do you have any Anzac soldiers? No. Um, well, there are. There might be a few on there that shouldn't be on there because of uh, the when when the import happened from Lies of the First World War. But no, for the most part, not. But there is a there is a, a very good Anzac site, uh, the name of which escapes me at the moment. Um, but if I I'll find it and I'll, I'll report back so we can share it with the group. But there, there is a very good site uh, in Australia, which has photos of Anzacs, um, Australia and New Zealand servicemen. Hmm. There you go. Um, Richie from the Girvin group saying that he has a couple of photos that he'd like to be able to share with you. Um, and he may be able to help with some stuff as well. So that's good. We all like a bit of sharing yeah. information thank you richie yeah, i can see you um and, and in fact claire mentioned you uh, yesterday um forwarded a mail and i saw some photos yes. that sent claire they were terrific photos um I, lo I love the one with the officer with all his uh, his braided cuffs and his collars i mean there's so much information there on those uh, on those uh, cuffs and colors that you can that, that say about the the regiment and the rank and the the, the the patterning of the collar and the patterning of the braid around the caps of the artillery and the engineers uh, and the hussars tells you so much about the regiments so there's a lot you can read into that so yeah i just uh, but i don't uh, i mean richard you seem to have a large collection but i think the majority probably don't have names on do they of the men you're muted richard. no 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 they don't a lot of them um a lot of them have been gleaned from as david was saying local newspaper clippings going through the microfiche and things like that but the, the photographs I've got actually come from the Marcus of Elder that owns uh, Killian Castle. His great, great, great grandfather is in these photographs. I've not quite managed to establish um, what one's him. Uh, but they're, they're, uh, I think looking at some of the photographs that you had, and you were talking about identifying medals, um, yeah. what I'd done was I tried to zoom in and I found that, that there was like the Egypt medal and the Khedive star. So I could obviously date it from after that time, um, but looking at the the regalia, and it's Royal Scots Fusiliers, but uh -huh. looking at it, you would, generally you wouldn't think, oh well, that's Royal Scots Fusiliers, so I was just wondering if I could if I could share that photograph with you, just to let you have oh, a yeah. look at it. Oh, please do, yeah, please do, I'd be, I'd be interested to have a look at it, um, that's great, yeah. Uh, do you want me to share it on here, or do you want me to just copy the link to it? I've, I've got, will you, yeah. Well, I can, I can actually let them share it if you want. Yeah. Have you got time to look at it, Paul? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah, let me just find you. You put me on the spot now, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nope, sorry. <laughs> well, my, my connection is very bad. It looks as I'm fading out here. Oh, no. You're lucky. I'm, I'm not allowed to share it. She's not letting me share it with you, so you're on no, right. Well, no. you can send it to me. I've got, or I've, I've got your contact details, Richie. I'll drop right. you. Okay. Fair yeah. enough. Good. Okay. That gets me off the hook. David's saying as well, newspapers are a great source for photos, but sometimes the digitised copies render the photos in very poor quality. I think we've all came across that. He's saying the National Library of Scotland have digitised a lot of the rules of honour which contain photographs. So, um, yeah, if you find a, a, a one that's not very great in the newspapers, that might be worth be worth checking. Yeah, the other thing is, of course, I mean, it's not necessarily the digitization process which is at fault. It's the way that they were microfilmed. Um, but, a lot, but a lot of the photos are poor, I know, and it's very frustrating uh, when you find somebody and and, um, and the image is too poor. But but knowing that it's there is one thing because you can then contact the British Library or or, or engage a researcher to go down and, and you know call up a copy, pull it from store, and, and get a get a proper copy done. So. Yeah, it's a bit of bit of a more of a convoluted route, but but knowing that it's there is the, is the first thing, isn't it? Actually, identifying it is great. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's so much nicer to be able to when you're researching someone to put a, a photograph to that face and actually see what someone looks like. Definitely. Oh, no, I think it's a th complete thrill to yeah. suddenly see a, a photo of your ancestor. Yeah, it's terrific. 
Yeah, I was researching one the other day actually for a, an Australian um, that was in the, the RAF and it was his wedding photograph and he married you know, a, a lady that was in the WAF and I was delighted but again the photograph's really not brilliant. Mm. <laughs> I'll need to see if there's a way of maybe um, getting my cousin in Australia to dig through somewhere and um, get a better copy for me. Can I ask a question? Um, I've yeah. got a, a great uncle. I've got his, um, uh, his one of his medals, uh, the 1914-15 star. But yeah. I've got his service number and who uh, who's with, it was with the Army Service Corps and uh, his name and his date of birth. Would I just put that into your site and see if I can find a photograph of him? Yes, you can just um, just put his name in. Um, well, I can probably do that now while I'm... Well, it's George Frederick Fordham. Let's have a look. Uh, D-H-A-M. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And he's a private, his number is M2 yeah. 114315. And his Army Service Corps. And um, he was born on the 11th of May, 1879. Yeah, I've, I've got him. Uh, I don't have all that information. I mean, my the data I have on my side is just pulled from the metal index card. So it, 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 you'll have seen this. Um, it just says George F. Fordham given the private army service corps and then you can the metal car but but there's no photo of him no, no. well, well I've, I've got one of his medals but uh, i um i just wondered if there would be in you know a group photograph or something like that you well, don't know what what particular part of the rasc um uh, the asc he was in you see yeah that's that's the problem with those you know, he went to the france and things and he came back in 16 um, and he had a silver war badge as well. So you've presumably downloaded all the um, the rolls and the silver war badge, badge roll from Ancestry, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've got that yeah. yeah, I think, well, again, uh, it's almost certain that he had a photo taken, and probably pals at some point, but, but where that photo is, uh, is another matter entirely, of course. So that's, that's a case in point to perhaps think about writing something about him. You've got a lot of information about him already. Yes. Something about him, write a one page blog, webinar, free of charge. Go to WordPress, go to Blogger, set something up um, with your contact details. Say you're looking for information, looking for a photo of George Fordham uh, or information and see what happens. You, I mean, you might, it might never happen, uh, Jeff. It might, you might never get a response, but, <clears throat> but, but on the other hand, you might. So it's worth doing. Uh, I've got um, World War One photographs of other family members, so I, I've got them, you know. So, uh, and I know who they are, but uh, that particular one I haven't got. Yeah. There's always one. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. So, so um, yeah. I, I mean, it is it is quite an interesting. I, I mean, I suppose I could put some of my family's photographs up onto your site, couldn't I? Well, you that. could do. Yeah, if, yeah. It's always um, well. You never know. There might be other people as I say, in other parts of the world who are looking for those photos that you have. And that's, that's the idea. It's just about sharing. Well, sharing. well they, I've got a photograph of one with his captain and people might be looking for the captain, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, there's that. And do you know the captain's name as well? I think so. Yes. I, I, I worked it out through his uh, war service record, uh, who his captain was and, uh, and his standing next to his captain, his, uh, is at home, but uh, you know, he's uh, got his captain there. So I think I, I, I can't remember the captain's name now, but I've got it written down. So, th so there'll be a, there'll be a, also be a record for the captain on the site as well. So you could yeah. upload the photo twice in that case, once yeah. for the captain and once for him. I have seen a photograph of him before, and he's been unnamed uh, on on the site. And I've worked out his name. And I, I contacted the person who put it up and uh, gave them what I thought was his name. Because uh, I'm on the Great War Forum and the World War Two talk, so uh, you know I've, I've done that. Okay, great, great. Well, please do, Jeff. I'd, I'd like to see them. Right. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Sounds like you're going to get lots of new content for your website. <laughs> well, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so but, if nobody has any more questions. Jackie does. Jackie does, okay. Yeah. Have I missed one? Oh, <laughs> we only have the name of Jackie's. You'll have to unmute though. All right. Um, yes, I'm George. I'm Jackie's husband. I have a <laughs> well, um, taken at Bisley in 1931. It's a shooting team of Edinburgh University Officers Training Corps of which I published a history a few years ago. Now, one of the men in the um, photograph is wearing a badge that I couldn't identify. And they, I sent it to the Army Museum and they couldn't identify it either. I've got the photograph here. If, if Paul, perhaps you could have just a quick glance yeah. um, and see what you can make of it. Okay. Um, so if you can let me screen share. I don't think it'll, does it allow you to do that? Do you get that? Is it Jackie? Yeah, Sutherland. Sutherland. Yep. Right, on you go, try. Oh. Name that badge. <laughs> it's like, name uh -huh. that tune, only different. <laughs> uh. Ooh. Can you see that? You should be able to. It's just badge can. here. I can see it, yeah. Um, you should be able to zoom in as well, George. Down, down in the bottom left-hand side, if you hover yeah, over, there's a little... If, if I enlarge it, it just becomes blurred. Yeah, yeah it just yeah. pixelates, yeah. I, I, I don't know. Um, it's bright like pillar, isn't it? But I can't see what the... I can't make that out, I'm afraid. Yeah. It's... It, mm. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, really. Um, have you tried, have you posted it on the, well, I know it's pre-World War II. That's a lovely photo, isn't it? It's 1931. Yeah, have you posted it on the World War II forum to see if anybody there knows what it is? No, I haven't. I know I know it's pre-Second pre, pre -Second World War, but, um, or for that matter, even on the Great War forum, if you're, if you're a member there, because uh, the man in the front's wearing First World War ribbons, isn't he? Um, but no, I, I, I don't know. I think it's, a, it's such an indistinct um, shape and there's nothing, it's almost like, a, it's just like a cross, isn't it, on his, uh, above it his... It almost looks like the shape of an airplane. Yeah, it could be. I think it looks a bit like the kind of like some of the sweetheart type badges that you get. Yeah. You know, they've got the, the bits either side and the circle bit maybe in the middle. Yeah, but they didn't wear those on uniform. No, I know that's what I'm no. saying, but it's it looks, you know, like that kind of shape. You, t I mean, you can wear you typically wear temperance medals, or you wear shooting medals, or football medals. The, those are seen on uniforms, but but I don't know what that one is. I'm afraid. No. Okay. Um, well, thanks for sharing. It's a great photo. That's a great picture. Now Rich is dead jealous because he didn't get to share his screen, and George did. <laughs> <laughs> So George, did you research all the all the men in that photo as well? Because you've got all their names on that blackboard, haven't you? Did, were you able to find out about those men as well? Um, no, I haven't researched the individuals. Um, I was doing a history of the um, well, the Edinburgh contingent of the officers' training corps from the original volunteers founded in eighteen fifty nine up to well five years ago. Um, that kept me quiet for the best part of a year, and I wasn't inclined to do further detailed research, put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it becomes a bit, um, takes over your life a bit. Yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all used to having uh, nights where you sit till like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> <laughs> so if nobody's got any other questions, I think we'll wrap up. I'd like to thank you very much for your talk tonight, Paul, on behalf of Lanarkshire Family History Society. It's been amazing. It's been brilliant, uh, as yeah. always. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Was, uh, thanks for being a great audience as well. You know. 
Okay, so we'll wrap it up. Um, lots of thanks coming in on the chat. Um, lots of people saying how amazing the talk has actually been. Um, Richie's saying a huge thanks. Yep. Um, so just a reminder that um, next month's talk is Christine on the 10th of June. So you can sign up for that now if you're interested. Um, so I think we'll call it a night. Thank you very much, Paul. And no doubt I'll catch up with you again soon. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Good night, everyone. Bye. Good night.